Hello, everybody, and welcome back. This is our uh, second week of class in the summer semester of 2021, and we are going to be working on our Chapter 14 exercises here today. Um, the nice thing is it seems like everybody's got all their software issues worked out. Everybody's got um, a version of an IDE that includes Java effects available to them. I know that many of my students are, are making the move over to IntelliJ for just ease of implementation, just being able to just use the product directly. I will be using Eclipse here tonight, but you know, it seems to me there's a, a strong tide pointing towards that, that product uh, in general. And so at some point I might switch over to it during the semester, if not only just to talk about the product itself uh, and demonstrate some techniques within it. Um, as we're uh, jumping into uh, unit one here, which is where we kind of begin this course uh, in chapter 14. So we begin you know, roughly halfway through the, through the book, and this is where they, they kick in and start talking about the Java effects topics, which we began talking about last week. And we did a very uh, primitive demonstration of an application that created one giant button on the screen that did nothing, but really talked about a lot of the different approaches that we use for building uh, Java effects applications. Um, and right now we're going to be jumping um, to the chapter 14 exercises. And the one thing I want to point out immediately uh, right off the bat is there's a, a link here. And if you read that carefully, it says image files for exercises, click to download. And so um, any of you that have purchased the, the textbook with a, a textbook code, you can sign up for the publisher's website, by the way go to their website, download uh, the zipped versions of the images, but I've already done that for you. You can find it actually both in, on the resources page up here um, or a handy zip file with uh, all the images for all the exercises for the whole textbook, by the way, right here, which is how they package it for the book. So if you wanna grab that file, it's helpful for completing these exercises because we do work with images straight away, right, right from the beginning. Um, and so once you get that zip file, downloaded go ahead and extract it and then put those extracted files uh, somewhere uh, a little more meaningful maybe than your downloads folder but it, even if it's there know where they're at so you can find them what i'm going to do is i'm going to uh, decompress that and i'm just going to just drag it over to the desktop uh, and put it there and and, and for me that that's a I think a better spot for you to find it in the downloads folder, but you work however you choose to. So whatever project we're going to be working with, um, we're going to be pulling this in for chapter 14 so we can get the images that they show in the book. Um, and if you're curious about what's inside this folder where you can take a look so you can see there's there's uh, flags from around the world and some little GIFs and X's and um, like some rotated words and some bizarre little stick figures and stuff uh, but apparently this is all the stuff you need uh, for doing all the exercises in the book including the separate folder which has a complete deck of cards uh, in it including the backs of the cards in either orientation uh, which we will also utilize and what's kind of neat about this textbook if you follow through with it from the beginning and work through some of their uh, case studies and stuff. They, they actually build entire card game games, you know, and they do it graphically when you get to these chapters. Um, and so if you're ever, you know, want something extra to do, you know, in your free time, you could like work through some of those exercises, uh, many of which the code is provided and answers are provided, by the way, by the publishers. Uh, but I think that's helpful to know. So we're going to keep these handy as we work. Uh, and as we need those images, we're going to pull them into our projects. And I'll show you how to do that, because uh, that can be a sticking point for some people. Uh, in fact, that code I told you about earlier that the one student was having a problem with, the, the problem was ultimately that the path statement in the code was incorrect to point to the image files. Therefore, they wouldn't load and the program would crash. Once the path statement was corrected, no problems. Um, and so that, that tells you a little bit about how important it is uh, to know where to put things. All right, so for chapter 14 exercises part one, we're going to do exercises one, two, and three, and then exercises seven and eight. So let's get started on those uh, first uh, three here. Those are easy to remember, one, two, three. And then I'll pull up my um, document here, which shows the exercise, and let's read it and take a look at what we're supposed to and I do, I do want you to notice also 
you know, maybe if you read the book carefully, you'll notice that it says the image files used in the exercises can be obtained from, and you can just go right there and you can get the zip file, the same zip file that I have in the resources folder, but that has uh, additional things in the file as well. Uh, the file that I have in the course shell is just the images, uh, just so that you're aware of that. But it, it always amazed me when I first started teaching off of this book, nobody would ever see this little tidbit, even though it was right above the exercise. So just in case you're missing it, I'm pointing it out for you. All right, but looking at uh, exercise 14.1 here, this one says, write a program that displays four images in a grid pane as shown in figure 14.43a. Now they're using flags from that folder that I just showed you. Um, and that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna try to mimic as best we can what we see on the screen there. Um, but it doesn't really say that it has to be flagged. So if you found a different images you wanted to put in there, as long as there are four images displayed in the grid, it's perfectly uh, valid in my mind. All right, so let, let's uh, just take a look at this and look at you know what we're trying to accomplish. We're not trying to like do anything aside from make things display. That should not be too difficult, especially if you did your readings and tried some of the examples that you saw in chapter 14. And I always encourage you to do that. Unlike Java 1, we will not be taking those in chapter examples and having you turn them in as homework. But I still encourage you real strongly to play with that code, copy the code, see how it works, see what it does, and then come to the book and do the, or the, you know, come to the exercises, do the exercises with the examples that you just tried in mind. And what you will discover is that most of those examples lead very solidly in this book to solutions for the exercises. And so therein is kind of the key to completing the exercises is trying the examples first. Chances are you're part of the way there already, or at least can look at that example, borrow something from it, and then utilize it in your solution. Or you know, it should get you thinking about it. All right, let's jump over to Eclipse. Uh, and first of all, let's begin uh, by, well, we, I already have a project created from last time. So um, if you don't have a project created, what you can do is simply come up here to the toolbar and choose File, New, Java Project, or go to the toolbar and choose Java Project and name it. What I had done last time is I chose Java Project. I knew that Chapter 14 was split into two exercise parts. And so I created one called Chapter 14, Part 1 that matches up with the exercises. Now, I did have this little sample program that we did last time. This is based on the first sample exercise from Chapter 14. Um, and I'm going to leave this up on the screen because I am going to borrow from it um, to just kind of save on my coding and make things go a little bit faster. Uh, so if you have that handy, go ahead and open it up. Otherwise, you'll, you'll have to type in the things that I'm copying here. It's not a whole bunch of things, just a few lines. All right. I'm also going to come over here to my Package Explorer in the sidebar, and I'm going to expand my project so I can see the resources for the project um, in a hierarchy. And I'm gonna begin by creating a new class file to solve exercise 14.1. And since it's called exercise 14.1, I'm gonna name it accordingly. I'm just gonna say ex14 underscore one. I can't use periods in uh, class names, but underscore works. Um, do I wanna do a public static void main? Uh, sure, why not? Uh, and we're just going to click finish. Uh, the one thing I will point out, and I'm going to do this at least initially, um, is I, I, my package declaration for my project is left blank. And I'm doing that with intent. I don't intend to have any of my programs, at least at this point, interact with each other. Um, if that were the case, it's, it's usually a better habit that whatever programs they put in the same source folder are part of the same package declaration. All that simply does is it adds a line at the top of your code that says package and then the name of the package. And it just basically links all those programs together. If you leave it blank, no big deal. They're still all in the same folder. They would still interact. Um, however, if you were planning on them interacting, then you would want to name it. So since we're not, we're leaving it blank. Right, so there you see the beginning of my new program here. And as we will do with all of these, uh, JavaFX programs, we will always add our inheritance piece. So we're going to add extends application class. It will underline red 
and I kind of automatically do this these days, is I leave my cursor flashing right in this spot here, and then I hit control space, and it brings up you know, the fix it panel or whatever you want to call it here. Uh, and it's suggesting that I use this library, Java FX application, which is correct. So I'll give that um, a single click to read the Java docs on it, if you're curious. Um, or I'm just going to give it a double click to go ahead and do the import. And now you can see the libraries added. Um, the other thing that happens is as soon as you do that, your, uh, your child class, if you will, uh, then needs to have a start method included, uh, which matches up with the application class, which requires it. So we're going to ho hover over that one and then choose add unimplemented methods, and it adds the start method. Now, my habit, and if you guys remember from last week, is I always take the main method and move it to the bottom of these applications because really its only function here is to trigger the program to run. And since we know that in advance, we're just going to put in the directive for doing so uh, straight away. So whenever we try to run something here, it will just work. And all you have to do is type in launch and then args inside the parentheses. Um, if you were calling it from the super class, you would say application dot launch. Um, but since we are extending uh, application already, it's already automatic. So we just have to call the method. It's really pulling from from this class up here, though, the application class. Now, with that maneuver, our uh, start method is at the top of our program now, along with the override which is generated if we're using a public static void main. And, and just to remind you of why we do that, um, normally uh, we would like to launch graphical applications without the use of the main method. However, in some environments, depending on JREs, JDKs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, sometimes it doesn't work. And so most GUI programmers do this approach to force it to work uh, or enforce it to go into GUI mode uh, where otherwise wise might not launch. Uh, but the, the general thinking and really modern versions of Windows, and I'm going to say Windows 7 on up, um, and Mac OS probably from, you know, probably since the Stone Age on up, uh, were able to run the GUI programs natively through the Java virtual machine without this little piece that I have highlighted. But it's just kind of an interesting, you know, little tidbit. Uh, we're going to keep using it uh, just because I think it's better practice um, from a professional standpoint to do that because uh, no pro would put out a piece of software and then go, oh, well, I hope it runs on your system. <laughs> you know, they absolutely must be sure of it, and that's one way to make sure of it. Right now, the other piece that we're always going to throw into all of our programs, and the reason that I left the previous application open was to basically get our stage and our scene all set up and presented on the screen and so functionally the four lines that i highlighted here in my old program that i'm now going to paste into the bottom of the start method of my new program those are going to be in just about every application pretty much this way with very slight alterations uh, and generally speaking uh the bottom two will never change right because you're always going to want to set the scene with the scene and then show this the, the stage and get get it on the screen the things that will change will be your title uh, and then the parameters that you're throwing at the scene. So what is it you're putting into the scene in the first place? Last time it was a giant button. This time it, apparently it's going to be some flags or images. Um, and then, you know, parameters like for sizing of the window. And, and those will mess with uh, every time. So why don't we go ahead and just change the title then. And let's call this exercise 14.1. And here I can use the point one, by the way, because um, this is just text. And we could also name it just the way they have in the book, display images. Now, in terms of what we're going to send to the scene, well, you know, I'll, I'll be, I'm going to be real frank. I, I don't know what I'm going to name it yet, right? Um, so let's figure out what we're naming the stuff, and then we can figure out that we're, we'll throw it in. Uh, and, it, and in fact, maybe instead of saying BTOK, I might call it, you know, whatever for right now, just to have something. I don't know what the size is going to be, but I can change that later. Uh, this is a good point now, by the way, to save. So I'm going to do a control S to save. I, I do realize that I have a red underline here. Uh, and if I was to try to run the compiler right now, it would flag it 
right? Because there's no object named whatever anywhere in my code that needs to be here. You'll notice in the sidebar here for Eclipse, and most IDEs do this somehow, there's a red flag to indicate there's a problem here. There's a one uh, box up here just to indicate that there are errors, but the specific errors will be shown along the sidebar, uh, both sides of the screen. So you notice here in the coding window, it also shows the problem. Um, and it takes it one step further when you come to this and you hover over the specific line attached to the problem. And you notice how the message that pops up when I hover over the error and the message that hub that happens in the sidebar, the top part of it is basically the same. It's saying whatever cannot be resolved to a variable. So it gives you options. I can create a variable, create a field, create a parameter, create a constant. And yes, those would all fix it, but that's not what the intent is. The intent for this spot is an object that would display on the screen. Uh, and that we have to come to that determination. We have not done that yet, but I've saved my code. I know there's an error in there, but we'll deal with it as we uh, progress forward. I, I'm going to pause the video here for a second um, and see how you guys are all doing. All right, we're back from a, a real quick little break here uh, where I was doing a status check with everybody. And the next piece that we're going to talk about is the, the types of display mechanisms that we have available to us to put visual content on the screen in a Java application. And in the general, the most general form, we have these mechanisms called panes. And in fact, they're part of this, this class uh, structure that if you read your book really carefully here, and I'm trying to scroll up to that part somewhat efficiently, <laughs> um, they talk about that as a class. And if I'm trying to get there, sorry, it's taking me a little bit. All right, so they talk about Java effects here, and then they start talking about, uh, right here in section 14.4, about panes, user interface controls, and shapes. And we have basically the ability to add these types of visual elements to our screen. And you'll notice once again that we, we talk about you know, windows, we talk about stages, we talk about scenes, we talk about panes, and, and you know, they're, they're choosing all these words carefully because nobody wants to say window, but that's really what we're creating when we say a pane. Um, and there's different types of pane, and what they do with these is they, they show that there's kind of like a, a general type of thing that you can put onto a stage and a scene. Ultimately, everything ends up on the stage. You can see this encapsulation that they have here for the structure, and I think this is important stuff to know folks which is why i'm spending a little bit of time lecturing on it but generally speaking the stage is the whole window the scene is what goes inside the window if you remember that whole bit so the stage is the thing that has the title bar the minimize maximize close buttons the little borders that you can grab and drag and resize that's all part of the stage the scene is all the stuff that ignores those pieces and is inside the window where the real stuff happens and so you can see that that type of hierarchy here, and I'm not sure if you guys are catching my mouse really well, but let me um, turn on my little spotlight tool. I think that helps uh, to see it. So you have the stage here, and then the scene um, is the part inside the window. So the window, the part inside the window. And then relative to the scene itself, we have the capability then to put objects inside the scene so that they're visible, right? And we can do that sometimes brute force and we did that last time with the button and in fact what we did last time is we created a button so you notice how it's under this category under control and the control is able to basically directly feed into the scene without any other layer in between right so that's kind of an interesting thought so i can take a text field a radio button a text area you know, a label which are basically words or create a shape or an image and drop those directly onto the scene, uh, brute force. And in some cases you do that, and we did it with the button. But what's usually better is you want to control that layout and the layout will, that you're trying to achieve is sometimes um, following a pattern. So whenever we look at a screen, we tend to design our screens very much that way in patterns. and Therefore, um, and, and I'm saying this 
largely for the benefit of the people who are strictly web developer students here. I think this, this should be all of you. Um, but in web development, we learn that we look at the screen as kind of a grid and we learn um, that we start doing layouts and we think about the, the, the size of the screen. And then we, we start to discover with web pages that you um, often take a web page and you put it into an encapsulating element. So for example, if you guys can recall back to your web one or web two class, where you might put a wrapper or um, a container around all of your code on a, on a web page, and then you might create a section of the screen that's a header and a section that's an, a navigation area and a section where content resides or images reside. Uh, and you structure it and you organize it and often it's done with various types of rectangular shapes typically. Um, a pane is a kind of class that was developed to kind of simulate that type of layout control that we have uh, you know with graphical layout programs. And so the grand class for all the different pane structures that we have is just called pane. And really what pane ends up doing is being just another encapsulated element inside of the scene, just like a wrapper would be for a web page. And then we discover that pane has several different types of sub panes, which allow for different capabilities. We have flow panes, which allow you to add content with a scroll bar, or a grid pane, which allows you to break the screen into sections. By the way, that's the one we're gonna use for the first exercise. Then we have a border, which kind of does the same thing, but has a kind of a, a quirky, characteristic to it, which I'll show you. Then we have H boxes and B boxes for either vertical or horizontal content. And then we have stack pane, which allows you to layer objects on top of each other. And the interesting thing about all of these pane mechanisms, folks, is that you can use them solo on a, on a, on a scene or a stage, or you can use them in combinations with others. And in some cases, using one pane structure to encapsulate other pane structures. And every time you add that layer of encapsulation, and I'm hoping this is a takeaway you remember from Web 1 at least, every time you do a layer of encapsulation, you have an additional layer of control over visual appearance uh, and, and control of the mechanisms within uh, and from without, you know, and that's really kind of the key. And those of you that have done web layout um, know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, and those of you who have not, that might be kind of a different concept, but th that's where we're pulling a lot of these conceptions from. Um, so let's keep this in the back of your mind. And this is a great page to bookmark, of course, for a test or an exam or a quiz or whatever, hint, 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 um, because this is that kind of important uh, information, very fundamental to GUI programming. But let's jump back over. And I've already kind of looked at both the clue from the book and actually, you know, maybe that's uh, a good way to look at it, too, is as you look at the exercise in the book, I'm sorry I'm scro scrolling so quick and I scrolled so quick, I went chapters past. To go back to that exercise listing, um, we're getting pretty close there. It's pretty sad when you know the chapter well enough and know where to scroll to. And I know I'm not quite there yet, but they demonstrated all the different shapes in the chapter and I hope you get a chance to play with all of them. Uh, but when we get to the exercises, they give you a, a hint, and, and this is what I'm uh, what, what I'm trying to point out, and the reason I'm going to the trouble of finding this is they give you the hint. Write a program that displays four images in a grid pane. They tell you what to use, folks. So if you're like, coming in here and you're using a flow pane in this situation or a horizontal box, I'm I, I will kind of get on your case a little bit. So we are going to use a grid pane as our major structure that we are going to insert uh, into the screen. Now, what I'm going to do really quickly before I, I do that is I'm going to draw on the screen here and just kind of give you a little bit of a, a demo. So this is my stage, the whole window. My scene is just inside the borders of that window. And now what I'm going to add is a grid pane. So that will sit as a larger object just inside the scene. And then it will break apart, hopefully, into you know four separate areas. So I'll have like this grid that will then create you know four boxes for me. And I might refer back to this, which is why I'm going to the trouble of going drawing on the screen. But that's basically what we're building. 
And then each one of these spots will have index numbers that drive the contents. Okay, so let, let's go ahead and clear that from the screen now. And now let's build it with code. Once you see the flow of this, uh, folks, it will become, believe it or not, somewhat automatic if you do it enough. All right, back over to the code now. So I've established for myself that I do want to build a grid pane. So if I want to build a grid pane, I'm going to call that in as a class, just saying grid pane, capital G, capital P. Uh, you see it underlines red, so control space to pull the library or hover. Java FX scene layout is the one we want to choose. And then we need to name that object, and I'm going to keep it really simple, you know, and just call it G pane. You want to call it you want to call it whatever hey you know what i already put whatever in my scene thing i'm going to call it whatever hey why not right just to prove that i can all right then we're also going to say here oops an equal sign not a minus equals but just a regular equals and we're going to say new grid pane with nothing being passed to it so that will create an object now called a grid pane object called whatever and so every time i do something with whatever um, i am going to uh, refer to it as whatever <laughs> i do find amusement in that endlessly i have to tell you guys um, all right so the first thing i'm going to do with whatever uh, our grid pane is as i look at these images and these aren't things that you would pick up on intuitively but the book does talk about them is i don't want my images to be touching each other when they output to the screen. And I am noticing there's a little bit of white space in between all of them. Uh, and I'm gonna build that that horizontal and vertical vertical gap into the grid pane right from the get-go. So back over to Eclipse, I'm gonna say whatever, and I'm gonna set set H gap, horizontal gap. And I'm gonna set it for a value I know the author usually likes to use five pixels. I usually, I'm a web person, I like to put in more than that. So I'm going to go with 10 pixels. I think that, that will look better. I'm also going to do the same thing for the vertical gap. So I'm going to type set V gap. And then once again, uh, I'm going to put in uh, 10 pixels. So 10 pixel offset, uh, you know, horizontally and vertically. Another thing that... Um, we typically do when we're putting stuff into a grid like this and and this is um, a matter of visual planning so you might not think of, to do this initially but you know i'm kind of saving us a step right now is i also like to center the contents within those grids uh, i just think it looks better and so i'm going to for our whatever grid pane i'm also going to tell it to set the alignment of the internal contents of the grid to center and here in order to trigger this this pulls in a special library by the way and we type um pos for position and then in all capitals and you can see how it automatically is pulling up the library here and there's an advantage by the way to pulling it from this drop down list rather than me typing it in here's the advantage if i pull it from the drop down list and you see i arrow down to it now i'm going to press enter it not only adds the correct code but also added the library where if i um, just type the word center in i would then have to hover over um, the word position to add the geometry position library but by choosing it from the drop down list it auto completed it for me and populated the import i'm not sure how intellij works in that regard um, but I, I i hope to god you guys are not still using jgrass but if you are please change <laughs> either to IntelliJ Eclipse or, or NetBeans would be the preferred product. IntelliJ. Right, so have our grid pane set up. IntelliJ. Okay. So, yeah, IntelliJ, is, I think IntelliSense is probably a little bit a better, Steve, and thank you for making that comment. Uh, and where I think it gets even more interesting is when you start to do any stylistic changes to JavaFX programs, because then you see it, um, like you put in a, like a color or something, and it will, you know, tell you what you're styling you know it, it has kind of like an internal comment to the code which i think is kind of neat uh, all right so we have our grid pane now set up notice that you know we chose the name whatever because we already had the name whatever down here in our scene 
And we are going to be looking at an output of 200 by 200. I don't know if that's appropriate or not. I'm going to guess that's probably way, way too small. Uh, but we need to worry next about the images that we're going to put into the uh, exercise as well. And so the next step is we could go directly to um, typing the code to add the images. But you know what? I don't have the images handy. So, well, that creates a little bit uh, of a problem. So let's go grab that image folder that we unzipped before. And i um, trying to remember where I put it. Here it is uh, on my desktop. And we have this whole image folder. Uh, and I know that we need all the flags. We don't need the cards. And it's like, well, should I bring the whole folder in? Or should I just find the flags that I need? And I'm going to tell you what the easier answer is. Just grab the whole folder. We'll pull out the images that we need. When the code compiles, by the way, it compiles out the other images that aren't being used in the program. Um, so if, if you're curious, so it, it hurts nothing to have the whole repository there. It's not really that big anyhow. If you if you do a, a check on the size of the folder, in fact, why don't, why don't we just do that just out of curiosity? You know, it's it's one and a half megs, folks. It's, <laughs> it's effectively nothing. Um, so it, it won't will not hurt your project. Now, what I would like you to do is once you have that folder unzipped, and I have mine, it's on my desktop, but we're seeing the folder view of the desktop right now. I'm going to actually drag this over to the project um, so that we can access it. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to click and drag and drop it right on top of that source folder. Uh, and then you'll notice that I get this little uh, warning. It says, select how files and folders should be imported into the project. And I'm going to have it copy the files and folders. And what that will do is it will make a copy in the project folder of that stuff, leaving the originals intact. And, and to me, that's a smart move anyhow. So um, do that. The other option, of course, is you can link to the files and folders. But then if you delete those or change them or rename them, it can, it can break your code, which is why I'm typically not a fan, especially when you're starting out. In some cases, it might actually be useful. Let's go ahead and do that. Now you'll notice as I as I did that, you know, when I have this folder here, just my regular file system, it's just a folder with another folder inside of it and a bunch of images. As it got pulled into the source folder, it broke it down into what we call object notation. And so we have one, the outer folder image, which has all the flags in it, right? So you see all the flags and whatever. Um, that just came in as image. And then the subfolder, which had all the cards, came in as image dot cards. It's using object notation to refer to the folder hierarchy, but it treats them as separate objects inside of the code. And that's really what it's doing is as you bring that those libraries in uh, or those images in, it treats them almost as an asset that we can dynamically refer to. Uh, and knowing the exact spelling upper lower case of these is important in terms of pulling the stuff into your code, by the way. All right. Another thing that you probably read about as you were going through the chapter is there's a few different ways, actually, which is always kind of uncomfortable with this stuff. It's like, if there's more than one way to do something, which one do I choose? But there's a few different ways to pull images uh, into uh, an application like this. The first one that we demonstrate in the book typically is this object called image view, which creates a container that allows me to load an image into it uh, directly. Now, you notice it is underlining. So once again, we're going to control space that. JavaFX scene image library is the one we want. And then we need to name it. Now, I'm going to be creating a separate image view for each flag. Now, I know I will get questions on this. Do I have to do it this way, Ty? No, you don't. In fact, some of you may have directly populated the images right into the grid pane, and that's absolutely fine. I'm just showing you a different way, if that's the way you did it. Um, both ways are, are completely valid. This way gives you more visual control. Um, so since I know I'm going to have multiple images, I'm going to start naming them kind of in what I would call standard programming notation. And that is, if you're naming a type of object, we usually have this you know, convention in programming where the first couple, two, three letters of whatever you're naming indicates what the object is. So in this case, I'm going to start with IMG to indicate that I'm naming an image. And um, I don't know, last time I called it V1 for something, for some reason. So I'm calling it V1 again. So image V1. And that will be a new image 
view. And then what we do with image views is image views are containers that hold images. And in the parameter here, we can just tell it which image to load. And I'm going to choose four of the flags from this folder. And in fact, if you want to, you know, you don't have to use the four flags that are provided. You know, so you can see there's American flags and Chinese and India, et cetera, et cetera. Use any of the flags that appeal to you. Heck, go to the internet, download your own if you want. That's fine too, very frankly. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and use the same ones that I used last time. So last time I used uh, image forward slash Germany. So you see how the, the notation here is very similar to writing web code, right? So it's in the image folder. It's not really a folder here. It's more of an object. But we use folder type notation and path statements to find the file. So this will point to the image object and the germany.gif file that's in that object. And that would be for the first view. Now, since I have four flags to do, I got to do this four times over. So let's just do it. Let's just paste it a couple more times. We'll rename each one of the uh, images. We'll just follow a sequence here. And then we can change the country name. So last time, the countries I used uh, these. And I, and I forget if this mimics what we have um, in the book as the assignment you know, descriptor. Nope, I guess part of it is figure out which flag it is. <laughs> so you might, some of you might have to look them up. Hopefully not, but you know, I, I, pretty realistic about things too. Um, so this little snippet of code here created image view objects and populated those image view objects with images from the folders that we imported into the project. However, right, they are still not, if I ran this program, it would run, but nothing would appear on the screen. Uh, a box would come up and it would be blank. Uh, and in fact, it might even throw, uh, well, these are yellow flags, so it wouldn't stop the program from running. You're just wasting code is what that, that's telling you. Our next step, and this is the, the part that's kind of hard for the GUI program, is understanding you like you create these objects, you put objects inside of objects, but I still have to put them somewhere where I can see them. In order to see them, I got to put them in one of those visual elements that is capable of being seen. And, and in this case, we created the grid pane. Now, the interesting thing about that grid pane, and if we go back to once again to the assignment description here, is the grid pane is basically, I mean, it's really easy for me as a human being to look at this and, and say, hey, I need two rows and two columns, right? Um, and I'm hoping your brain uh, thinks like that. And when I have um, a row, this row here is going to be like start, um, you know, at number zero. And this is one of those things that the books, book talks about. And then the next row uh, down here is going to be Let's see if I can annotate the screen with text. I don't usually use this tool, by the way, which is why I'm kind of fumbling with it. But um, we always start counting at zero. So the first row is actually row zero. The second row is row one. Same thing happens with the columns. So this up here would be column zero. And in this case, I'll just space over. And this will be column one. Um, and so this position on the screen where the British flag is would be position zero, zero. Um, over here on the uh, Canadian flag, and I guess I can just space over here, this would be, forget if columns go first or um, whatever. You know what? I don't remember. I'll be real frank with you. We'll figure it out as we code. But this is probably going to be either one, zero or zero, one. Uh, I believe if I, I think row goes first, so I'm just going to speculate and say this is zero, 01, which would make this one 10 and this one uh, 11. And if it's not correct, well, hey, you know what? Undo that by watching the rest of the video. All right. So sorry uh, for the confusion on that one, but it shows that, you know, programmers don't often memorize all this stuff, folks. We just refer to things, you know, and we sometimes we just try it and see which way is right. And then we go, oh, yeah, that's how you do it. Um, and then we look like we're smart, which we are because we've just figured it out. So, um, now, in order to get the, the actual images, um, they're in the image view, but now we got to get the image views into our grid. So the way that we do this is we'll call upon our grid pane, and now we'll 
add dot notation to it to pull in a method called add. And in this case, uh, we're only adding one object to it so we can use the singular add. If we were adding multiple objects, we would choose uh, add all, but that's not a, a thing that you do here. So we're going to say add, and the syntax for what is populated here, and see I'm trying to invoke the IntelliSense, so I'm going to backtrack, so we're doing add. There we go. And see, here's the answer. So first comes the column index and then the row index. So I did it backwards, by the way. Um, but the child that they're referring to, the first uh, parameter that we're passing is going to be whatever object we want on the screen. And for us, it's going to be image view one. So image, and I named that lowercase, so image v1. And the second position will be the column index and the column index in this case will be the top leftmost one we're going to go up this position column zero and the row index will be the same and then we're going to follow through on this now and we're going to go ahead and build through each of the rest of these so we're going to repeat this and then we're just going to change the column and row index values and the image view that we're pulling in and then that will change the code and make it work. So this will change, I'm just kind of doing these sequentially, image view one, two, three, and four. And then the way I did this last time, so the column index goes first, so I'm working across the row. So Germany, image v1, will be top left most next to it to the right of it will be image view two or china and then if we go to this next row that'll stay the same the column will start in column zero but the row will be row one and then we'll move to column one row one for the uk and the us and then folks that's pretty much all the code here to make this one work so here's here's a completed code in the start method i'll give you just a second to uh, take a look at that uh, I am doing a control S to save, and I'm going to be bold here. I don't see any red highlights in either margin, no yellow ones either. Uh, very good sign. Let's go ahead and hit the run button and see if we can get these flags up on the screen. Excellent. Now, the only thing I'm seeing as a problem is, uh, you know, the parameters for the size of the window. If this is 200 by 200, uh, a little wider probably will do it, maybe a little taller too. So let's, let's go with... Um, maybe 400, 300, bigger is better. And let's uh, save it and run it again. And there you go. Doesn't look too bad. Um, I think, you know, in my mind, it would probably look a little bit better um, if all the flags were the same size. Um, or if you want to goof around with some other images, um, you know, feel free. You can download stuff from the internet. Just, you know, download images that are efficient is my... <laughs> My you know, suggestion, don't download images that are multiple megabytes. They manage to do all of these images here, which is probably like 50 or 100 images, um, with just GIFs and kept it under uh, a megabyte and a half. So, you know, try to go with that as a challenge. All right, so this is exercise 14.1 uh, completed. All right, folks, uh, I had a couple of questions as we took a break here, just checking on everybody's progress. And one of my students um, used this approach to actually solve this programming problem. And this might come across a little small code-wise on some people's screens. But if you're, the, the question, and, and this is one I commonly get at this juncture, is you know the book demonstrates you adding images to the image object and then putting them in an image view and then in putting them in a pane and putting them on the screen, which is one layer more of encapsulation than what we use. So really, when you use the image class or you use the image view class, those have special capabilities to them. So why do we use them or not use them? In some cases, we use one or the other because they have certain methods attached to them that can do particular functions. You know, we're not really brushing upon those here in this class. Um, but that's one consideration. The other consideration is just from the standpoint of encapsulating your code. So if you're looking here at, um, and I'm not sure if this is, annotation is coming through or not. Um, I, I suppose that's pretty irrelevant, I, I, honestly. Let's see. Here we go. So when you look at 
um, you know, the you're creating this image object here with an image already in it, you're giving it a name, and then you're adding it to the image view, right? And then we're still taking that image view, uh, and it's being added to the pane. It's just being done in a different way. And Adam, you used, I think, one of the examples that they were sort of demonstrating, and that's absolutely fine. You know, and I was making the point uh, as the video was paused too, that it's also completely possible to just take the image itself, brute force like this, like the one I just underlined, and just drop it into that first position of the parameter, just the file name, and that would show the image as well. It's not fussy about how it'll take it. And, and, and this is where the complication comes in. None of those techniques would be wrong. So if you turned in any approach that got those flags on the screen, I'm all for it. You know, the, really the biggest part of it is getting the grid pane to work more so than the image or the image view objects. And thank you for sharing your screen, Adam. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, I'm gonna take the screen back from you if you don't mind.